We spend a lot of our time at the workplace, and it is an opportunity for ministry, but it's also a challenge. Oftentimes it's hard to know as a Christian, when do I speak up? When do I go along with the flow? But Bernadette and Mike are here to share their story about how God entered into the workplace and how uh, she came to faith in Christ. Uh, share with us a little bit about your background and how you met Mike and just where you were spiritually when you began to wrestle through these concepts. I moved to Augusta about five years ago for work. I'm a physician assistant at University Hospital. And from what I think now was maybe some divine intervention, I got paired up with Dr. Watts uh, with work and uh, grew up a Catholic, did everything that I was supposed to do, all the, follow all the proper steps uh, from what, uh, being from young until, you know, adult. And through college, through my adult life, I would, you know, go to church, but felt like I needed to go to church because that's what, had to, what I had to do. She asked me the question, do you believe in divine intervention? And it struck me that, yes, indeed I did, because here she was, a young lady from Ohio, had no reason to be in Augusta, Georgia. She had a good job in Ohio. I had not, had, I had not planned on having a physician's assistant. And here the two of us were together, and this whole process had taken place because of her desire to know more about what God had planned for her, and it opened my eyes to the fact that I was being used as an instrument of God, and if I had not been willing to participate, then this whole story may not have taken place. Once you decided, I do want to investigate, I'm sure there was questions and turmoil, but what did the process look like, and how long did it take before you came to that point where you knew that, that you wanted to commit your life to Christ? It just slowly started out the process of just asking questions and and just talking with him, uh, kind of every chance I got to. Uh, and then he asked me to come to a service. And uh, my eyes were kind of open. It wasn't, there were parts that were maybe similar to what I was used to, but there are other parts where it was just interesting and, and brand new for me. Uh, so I started coming to church and would come to morning service and um, actually went to uh, Sunday school with him and his wife and, and their class and then kind of got into going to the night service as well on Sundays. And uh, it, it took a while. I was probably coming as a visitor to uh, service maybe for about eight months to a year before I decided to take the inquirer's class. And then, you know, I would do, you know, start reading the Bible more, start doing my daily devotionals. And then after I think the inquirer's class just kind of I felt whole inside after going through that process and knowing that this was right for me. This is what I needed in my life. Uh, this is uh, where I belonged, actually. And, um, you know, the conversation hasn't stopped between him and I, and we still continue to uh, talk, and he still continues to mentor me in my, my spiritual growth. So um, this is just this kind of it. <laughs> And yes, that is it, that you'll find yourself among people and places that God has a bigger story for you to enter into. We're privileged to have Matt Bradner here this morning. Uh, this is the second week of a five-week series. Last week, John Barrett spoke about understanding procl proclamation is, is understanding word and deed, uh, biblically and historically uh, really did a great job of walking back through that understanding. And uh, next week, Drew Warner from Perimeter Church in Atlanta will be talking about how to build relationships where we live, work, and play. What does it mean to, to uh, more uh, intentionally strengthen relationships in the area of evangelism? Matt will talk today about um, the particular part of winning others to Christ through words and relationships. Matt's uh, on staff as the director of Campus Outreach in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's also a nationally sought-out speaker, not just with campus ministry, but he and his wife do marriage seminars. He's uh, been at Liberty University finishing up a uh, Master's of Family Therapy degree. He uh, does uh, speaking for businesses as well as for churches 
It's a great privilege to have him here because he's an effective evangelist. But more than that, Matt, come on up now, is effective at teaching people in winsome ways how to share the gospel. Matt, thanks for coming. I know your son Toby is with you. Toby, just raise your hand. We're glad you came down from Virginia with Matt. And uh, glad you're here, brother. Thanks, man. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm glad to be here as well. So Toby is with me and uh, my wife, Julia, and the rest of our clan are back in Virginia. We're in Lynchburg. And so Toby is my second born. We have four boys and a little girl. Um, uh, My man to your far right, he's not a girl, as he tells everybody. Uh, He's so kind. You know, he's at Subway. He's like, excuse me, ma'am, I'm a boy. Um, And uh, I uh, tell him until he cuts it, that's going to happen. But, um, but, but I'm glad to be here. And, um, um, you know, when I think about these opportunities um, and my goal, I think of three words. So if you, if you want to know what my win is, is first word, I want to be catalytic. Uh, I want to say something that, that sparks in your heart and mind in this area of evangelism. I want to be positive. Uh, I, when I say positive, I don't want to just give us a list of things to avoid. I really want to give you a vision, something to run after, and I want to be helpful. I really am going to speak, I'm going to try to speak practically. Uh, I I want to speak in such a way that this afternoon you could apply this talk. And so so that's my win, catalytic, positive, and helpful. And uh, many of you are familiar with the speaker and the author, Simon Sinek. Simon has really put one word on the forefront of thousands of leaders' minds, and the word is... Why? Uh, If you haven't read Start With Why or at least watch the TED Talk, I'm kind of a TED Talk guy, Um, I really encourage you, uh, just search up TED Talk, Simon Sinek, uh, Start With Why. But but in summary, he really says that while we jump to the what and how, the most powerful and enduring motivator is to start with why. And when I have opportunities like this in the week before, I'm asking the question, why am I excited to talk to you about evangelism? And it seems fitting that, that I would give you a glimpse at what motivates me. And, and maybe some of you are here and, and you don't know, you don't, you don't have a why when it comes to evangelism. Well, here's a glimpse of mine. In Colossians 1, the Apostle Paul says something that, that amazes me. And, and here's, here's what he says. He says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this, your hope in heaven, you've heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. So here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, the gospel is already a global force. It's a global force and it is spreading everywhere And what I'm amazed at is what he says next about the global force. Look at this. He says, of this you have heard, thank you, and before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And look at this, just as you learned it from Epaphras. We know in 412 that Epaphras, Paul says, is one of you. He's a local boy. And so this global force is being carried through local faces. That's my why right there, is that the global force of the gospel, which includes Augusta, Georgia, we know, is being furthered and carried by local faces. And my hope and my my conviction is I know this room is full of Epaphras. It's full of local faces who get to play a role in the global force, the greatest story in the history of the world. We have an opportunity to play a role. Epaphras is a glimpse that God uses individual, ordinary, local people to be a part of the extraordinary global work of God through history. I don't know about you, but, but I, I've watched a lot of things go by in my life. Maybe I'll end today if we have time with, with a story, but I don't want to watch this one go by. I want to be a part of what God's doing. So, so let me pray, and then, then we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, I pray you would spark our heart. I pray, God, you'd give a vision to run after. And I pray, Father, that, that you would uh, mobilize people, that this message would be helpful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So on Sunday, April 2nd at 1231 p.m., 
I received this text message. It said, is this Marty B? And I kind of chuckled at that. Uh, my name's not Marty, in case you missed it. Um, I'm Maddie B. But when you text Maddie, it often autocorrects to Marty. In fact, some of my best friends send me heartfelt messages to Marty. And I say, it's so good being known, you know. Um, and uh, it said to Marty B. And, and a few seconds later, it was asterisk Maddie B. And that doesn't sound significant. Is this Marty B? Um, but the moment I saw it, I knew that this was a significant text. The very next day, I was sitting at Kyoto Express, eating a nice Japanese plate, chicken teriyaki, um, hold the onions. Uh, and I was sitting across from a guy, um, a guy much larger than me named Cody, and he was enjoying um, a plate of Japanese. And there for about two hours, um, I drew out the gospel on a napkin. Um, I, I love using the bridge diagram. Um, and we talked through the gospel as we ate Japanese. Japanese. And at the end of, the, of our lunch, um, I said, Cody, uh, do you want to do you want to turn from your sin and trust in Christ? And Cody looked at me and he said, I do. And I said, uh, I got plenty of room in my suburban. Uh, let's go in my suburban. And so right outside of Kyoto Express, just a few hours after getting a text, is this Marty B? Um, Cody trusted in Christ. And, uh, and, and still to this day, I'm investing in Cody and I'm helping him learn to walk with God. Uh, so what's the backstory? Here's the backstory. Nine months earlier, um, somebody told me there's an incoming basketball player named Cody Lang, and he has some spiritual interest. I was doing ministry with athletes, and so I said I'll initiate to him. And so I initiated to Cody. We were talking about social life and sports, and uh, my, my first conversation with him was, hey, man, I got a big fantasy football draft coming up. What do you suggest? And, and his great wisdom, he said, pick good players. I was like, <laughs> thank you. Um, and... Uh, and, and so we, we were hanging out, and, uh, and I invited him. Uh, he came to a Bible study, and I quickly realized that Cody didn't have any significant spiritual interest. But we had a number of interactions following. Nine months went by. Nine months. Little to no interaction between me and Cody. And then he sends me a text, is this Marty B? What happened in those nine months that caused him to reach out for spiritual help? Or more importantly for today... What happened in our few encounters that caused him to want to reach back out to me when God began to work in his heart? I really believe much of the reason why Cody reached out to me after nine months was because of my conviction to live out the principles I'm going to share with you today. My conviction is that at some point in time, every single person is going to have spiritual interest. Every person is going to have spiritual questions. The question is whether they know a Christian that they are comfortable and that they desire to reach out to in order to get, engage over the questions. My goal is I want to be the type of person to seekers and skeptics that they would be glad to reach out to when God begins to stir their heart. That's my perspective. So you could say a lot of my perspective in personal evangelism is positioning. I'm positioning myself to be the type of person that you're comfortable with, you feel safe with, and that you would desire to reach out to me when God begins to work in your heart. And I don't know where you're at with that, but I hope by the end of today you would long to be that type of person, that you would long to say, how can I relate to people in such a way that I'm comfortable and safe and warm. And I've been asked to, uh, this is the topic, how to relate to seekers and skeptics in a winsome, in a warm way that ignites interest. That's a great topic. How to relate in a winsome and warm way that ignites interest. Uh, years ago, I asked Mike Heron a question. Uh, how do we do something? He says, if we figure it out, we'll win the world. Um, well, that's my answer today. If we figure it out, we'll win the world. No, I think, um, I think we have some things we can share. So, so here's the setup. Um, I have really three categories that I think about. Um, if uh, We'll move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, the three categories are really basic. They're, they're simple. If we want to be winsome, warm, and ignite interest, um, we need to address, number one, our passion. 
Number two, our perspective. And number three, our practice. Now, these all three uh, could be talk series, but I'm obviously just going to touch on them and uh, give you what I think is most important this morning. So, so number one, um, if we want to be winsome, warm, and if we want to ignite interest, we've got to address our passion. When I say our passion, I mean our love, our joy, our curiousness, our interest. The starting point of the conversation begins with us. So about uh, maybe six or seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a 15-in-1 game table for my boys. It was a uh, miniature pool, air hockey, um, uh, uh, it had a, like a foosball. It, I mean, it, literally, it was a boy's dream, right? Uh, it did everything but dispense Skittles and give Coca-Cola. You know, it was just a dream. Well, we purchased it in October. We were going to give it in Christmas. And so we put it up in our walk-up attic and we were storing it up there. Well, one day we were getting out winter clothes and I asked my oldest Isaiah to go up to the attic with me and get some clothes. And so I grabbed my box and I walked down And about a minute went by and I realized that Isaiah was still up in the attic and I could just picture him drooling all over this game table. And I said, Isaiah, hey, buddy, why don't you come down? You know, uh, that's the uh, self-controlled. And a couple seconds went by. I said, Zay, Zay, now. And he walked down and he knows his dad. And Isaiah said, Dad, you got a Christmas present up there, don't you? (laughs) And and, and I said, I said, I I do. And, And he said, Dad. I saw it. (laughs) And I said, you saw it? He said, I saw it. He said, Dad, thank you and Mom. And he did a classic. (laughs) And I looked at him, and we stood at the base of the walk of agony, and I said, you saw it? He said, I saw it. I said, you didn't see it. And he goes, I saw it. I said, you didn't see it. I said, your reaction, or shall I say, your lack of reaction shows me you didn't see it. Because if you saw it, you wouldn't say, Dad, I saw it. You would be jumping up and down. You would say, how can I keep this a secret, Dad? You didn't see it. He said, you're right. I didn't see it. (laughs) What's the point? The point is that we will speak in direct correlation to what we see or what we don't see. And if we want to talk about being winsome and being warm and igniting interest, then we first have to go back and ask the question, what have we seen in God? Here's a way to say it very specifically. Before we ignite interest in others, we must be ignited by God. Before we are winsome, we must ourselves be won by God. Before we warm, we must be warmed by God. We can't be like Isaiah in the Christmas present, pretending like we see something in a way that we never have. I think that winsome evangelism begins with being won by God. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this quote by A.W. Tozer. Um, If you'll put that next slide up, please. It says this. um, It's a great quote. He says, what comes to our mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. For this reason, the gravest question before us is always God himself. The most important fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his heart conceives God to be like. And here we go. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. I translate as that we speak what we see. Whatever vision of God you and I have, we are moving toward it, and that's what we'll represent to others. And it's impossible to represent God in a winsome way if he's not winsome to us, in a warm way if we're not warmed, in a curious way if he doesn't ignite our imagination. You know, there are many reasons why people don't believe in Christianity. Uh, But there's one that gives me the most trouble, and it's one that the disciples struggled with. In the book of Acts, after Jesus had lived a perfect life, after he had died a sinner's death and he was resurrected, he appears to the disciples and they touch his hands and they touch his feet. And then it says this. Look at this uh, next slide, please. They did not believe because of joy and amazement. It was too good to be true. They, They literally said, I don't know if I could believe this because this seems too good to be true. 
You ever seen that? They didn't believe because it was too good. And here's my question. How often do we get there? How often do you get to the place in your personal life where literally you're stunned and staggered at the goodness of God presented in the gospel? You're overwhelmed that the ultimate one is intimate with you. I tell people right away in evangelism, I tell people, look, I believe some crazy stuff. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm not going to pretend in evangelism like I believe things that are easy to, to believe. I tell people, you ever seen Horton Hears a Who? The guy's telling people that there's an elephant in the sky that talks to them. I feel like that guy telling people that there's a God who created the world and he made me and he actually loves me that I rebelled against him, that he would send his son for me, that I would live forever. That's some crazy stuff. But there's also some crazy stuff that is not with him in their worldview. And I think that mine's a little less crazy than that. But let's don't, I'm not going to pretend like I don't believe some crazy stuff. When are you staggered by the goodness of God? See, here's the thing. Um, it starts to be winsome, warm, and ignite, ignite interest starts with what God's doing in our heart. We can't separate our worship and our witness let me give you one example, and then we're going to move into the, the practicals today. Um, next slide, please. Just take the Holy Spirit. Look at this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, right? The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do to be a witness. He empowers us for witness. But do you know what else the Holy Spirit does? Do you know what else? This is one of my favorite verses. And I think if you would say, you know, Mike said, Maddie's a good evangelist. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. I've had the privilege of seeing many people come to Christ, but I, I think that I'm just, I'm a good 1 Corinthians 2.12-ist. Um, what is that? Here's 1 Corinthians 2.12. Look at this. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but we have received the spirit of God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. You know what the Holy Spirit's role in your life is? The Holy Spirit's role is to explode your mind and explode your heart with the abundant generosity of God to you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He explodes our understanding of how good God is to us, and then He enables us to go, go and share that with others. So I would just say that the starting point to being winsome is to be one with the goodness of God to you. The starting point to be war uh, warm to others is to be warm. That, that I was a re rebellious man and God has reconciled me. Igniting interest by having ours ignited. That's the starting point. We shouldn't separate it. So the best thing you can do in order to be winsome is to be one daily by the gospel. Daily get to the place where you, you shake your head and you say, that is a little bit ridiculous, God. Really? Really, God, in the coming ages, you'll show the riches of your grace and kindness in Christ, like, like really forever. Um, all things work for the good of those who love God have been called according to his purpose. You know what the Greek word for all me actually means? All. <laughs> that's what it means, all. See, that's what I do right there. I literally look up a word like all, and I'm like, is it really? Is it? It is. Oh, my goodness. Wow, like, like that's where it begins. Okay, the second category is our perspective. So I want to give you two shifts in perspective uh, that i like for you to consider. Here's shift number one. Um, and, and I'm trying to just, uh, there's so much we could say here. I'm trying to, to uh, just distill it. I really want to invite you to shift your focus from hearing as the goal in evangelism to understanding. You know, for many, the process of evangelism is getting out a certain set of words or theological points, and that's evangelism. Uh, I grew up, and there was a game called $10,000 Pyramid. Anybody ever remember that game? Um, uh, it's amazing. If, in, in, uh, what, what's the uh, briefcase game, uh, Make a Deal? Um, anyways, if you get the $10,000 briefcase today, you're crying, you know, but that was like a, a, a big thing. $10,000 pyramid, you're not crying. Um, bad joke. I went off my notes. All right. Um, $10,000 pyramid. The game was this, that if you could get your partner to guess a certain group of words, then you win, right? If they say the words, you win. 
A lot of us view evangelism like that. If we speak a certain number of words, a certain number of theological points, then we've evangelized somebody. And the focus there is on that we, our focus is that we want another person to hear certain things. If they hear them, we've evangelized them. And while that might be true at some level, that's not the type of witnesses that we want and need to be. We need to shift from hearing to, event, uh, to understanding. And this isn't a trendy thing. This isn't like something we came up with in Virginia. Uh, this is just biblical evangelism. It's always been there. Uh, put up the next uh, verse for me. Let's go back to my man Epaphras. Um, man, if we were going to have another kid, which we're not, I might name him Epaphras. Um, <laughs> Uh, our fifth Benson, uh, it's Benson period. Um, but uh, look at this. Uh, of this you heard before, yeah, we had commas after them all, um, no more. Um, you heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you. Indeed, the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth. Just as you learned it, from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. You see that? That evangelism or successful evangelism. And, and, and I don't mean, I, I mean that which is beyond our control. Successful eternal evangelism is not just when somebody hears a certain set of words and principles. It's when somebody understands them. And I would love to challenge you to move beyond just wanting to be a part of people hearing the gospel to actually wanting to be a part of people understanding the gospel. You know, as parents, we often say the phrase, how many times have I told you that, right? Well, whose fault is that? Is that the child's fault because they haven't learned it? Or is that really an issue with the parents? That, yeah, you've said it over and over, but for some reason they've never learned it. So maybe you need to do the hard work of figuring out a new way to say it so that they would learn it. That's a little shift in evangelism that I'm not interested in just saying words. I actually want to figure out, do you understand the words that I'm talking about? Um, another place where you see this is in Acts 8, where Philip walks on the Ethiopian. And when Philip walks on him, he, he sees him reading the book of Isaiah. He doesn't say, can you read? Right? Oh, you can read? Good. Just making sure. We got him. You know, he says, do you understand what you're reading? And look at this. The Ethiopian says, how can I unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. I, I think that a shift from hearing to understanding is the willingness to get involved in someone's life and be a guide for them. To actually do what we saw in the video, which is to create a relationship. We used to talk about making evangelistic presentations. How many gospel presentations? Now we talk about how many evangelistic relationships are you in? How many relationships are you in with people where you consistently and regularly talk about spiritual things? The shift needs to go from hearing to understanding. Well, how does this translate in how we, how we relate to others? In today's post-Christian culture, Christian vernacular is not spoken or Christianese. People don't understand Christian terms. They don't understand what sin is, what the Great Commission is, what salvation is, what faith is, eternal life is. When we share with people, people just have no clue what we're talking about. Unfortunately, um, you know, there are many studies. Look at any um, study about percentage of Americans who recognize certain words or phrases and our culture is biblically ignorant. Um, there were a number of uh, years back, a group of Harvard graduates did a phenomenal study that's influenced my evangelism. Here was the study. They were over at Cambridge and they had somebody with an English accent approach another English man or woman on the street and say, can you tell me how to get to so-and-so? The person said, you go this, you turn at this, and it'll be on your left. The next person, they, they did this, and they, pulled, they did this with, with hundreds of people. They had people with an English accent go up to strangers and say, I'm not from around this area. Can you tell me how to get to so-and-so? And they said, you're going to go about this far, and you're going to look for, and they described the landmarks, and then you're going to go about this far, and you're going to look for this. And then the third person with a foreign accent, 
approached people and said, can you tell me how to get to so-and-so? They're obviously not around here. Do you know what the majority of people who actually wanted to help this person, do you know what the majority of the people did for the foreigner? They drew out a map. They said, you, okay. Here's what you're going to do. You are right here. You're going to go here. And I want you to know that that's the culture we live in. We live in a culture where people are not from the Christian ideology and understanding. And that I think I'm influenced. I share the gospel most often through ways that I can write down, like the bridge diagram or two ways to live or, or other ways. And I'll actually tell somebody, I will regularly say, I say, you know, there's a lot of different views on what it means to be a Christian. Some people say you do more good than others. Some people say you just have to go to church. Some people say as long as you're not something else. Would it be okay if I drew a little something out that I think is the best summary of what it really means to be a Christian? And I'd love to get your thoughts on it. It'll only take a couple minutes. Usually if I have a relationship with somebody, they would say, sure. And I share and I say, do you understand when it say the wages of sin? Like, what do you think sin is? We're, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand um, with them. That's the first uh, shift is we, we move from hearing to understanding. The less knowledge and familiarity that individuals have, the more in depth the directions we give to them. Here's the second shift I want to call you to. Shift your focus from event to process. From event to process. And, and I'm thankful for the video. Uh, she mentioned this uh, actual phrase of a process. Um, if you'll go a couple slides, we, we have this. One more. Um, thank you. Just like evangelism was focused on getting out words, it's often been viewed as an isolated event. And, and this really feeds into an American or Western way of thinking and in our technological age where we want things immediately. Um, a number of years back, I was in Thailand and um, I ordered food and an hour later, nothing came out. And I called the manager over and I said, excuse me, sir, um, uh, it's been an hour. And he said, um, is there a problem? I said, uh, yes, it's been an hour. We haven't got anything. He said, was somebody mean to you? No. Um, and he said, did, did you get the wrong food? He said, no, it, it's, it's been an hour. And he said, what's the problem? You know, just time. It's just they have a different view of time. And, and we have this instantaneous, I want to see immediate impact. And, and I would suggest that, that our shift needs to be I want to get in evangelistic relationships where I'm actually helping somebody understand and I want to have a category for not only evangelism as, a, as an isolated event, but a process. And I'm not saying that, that evangelism and people coming to Christ can't happen in an event. We ought to pray that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't want it to, but I'm upholding the value of a process. So go to the next slide. The Apostle Paul, this is a great uh, passage. L look at this. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Paul was sharing his testimony. I love this. Do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? How good is that? You think I want to become a Christian today? And Paul says, whether short time, yeah, I got a category for that, or long. I hope you'll become as I am, just not these chains. I just think we ought to learn from the Apostle Paul. Sure, it could happen today, but it's likely that it's not. It's likely that this is going to be a process. And so things change, right? Things change whenever you take a long view. Tim Keller was asked uh, a number of years ago, on average, how many times do you think people hear the gospel before they understand it? He said, uh, on average, we see that people need to hear the gospel clearly around seven times before they really begin to understand it. Seven times, short time or long. Um, in my experience, um, well, how does this translate? We'll get a little more practical. We get to know people. We learn their story. We're patient and gentle with them. In baseball language, we're not always swinging for the fence. We're okay to hit singles. Uh, this is maybe one of the most successful um, aspects of my evangelism is that uh, here's how I think. Um, I plant seeds, not trees. I plant seeds, not trees. Um, please put up the next passage. This comes from Matthew 13. Um, he told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed 
which a man took and planted in his field, though it's the smallest of all trees, it, when it grows, it becomes the largest. No, though it's the smallest of all seeds, when it grows, it becomes the largest of plants. It becomes a tree so that the birds come in and perch in its branches. I want you to think about this for a second. This is obviously Jesus talking about the kingdom of God as a whole. I think all of these parables also relate to the kingdom of God for the individual. This is the series of seven kingdom parables. Think about this, though. As we grow as Christians, God takes over more and more of our lives. And we forget that what is now this massive tree that's touching every area of our life began as a seed. And if you forget that, then you become a tree planter. And you start to think that this thing that has overtaken your life for the last 15 years, you've got to somehow get it into another life. Think about the burden, the just physical burden of carrying a fully mature tree around looking for a place to plant it. When we, when we plant trees, not seeds, we either become overly aggressive or overly avoidant. We either say we're going to get all of the kingdom of God and everything that you need to know about the kingdom of God in your life. You know that's going to change and that's going to change and that's going to change. And you're overly aggressive or you're overly avoidant, which is you're like, there's no way. I mean, imagine this. Imagine a massive, a massive uh, oak tree that was planted in the center of this room. You planted a seed and, you know, a couple hundred years later, this massive oak tree, okay, it, it, it grew in this. Now imagine trying to get a fully mature oak tree into this room. You would just say it's a lost cause. Some of us view evangelism like that. We just look at what God's done in our life and we look at somebody else and we say, there's no way. There isn't a way if you're planting trees. But if you're planting seeds, there is a way. I ask myself the question, how can I plant a seed in my neighbor's life today? How could I plant a seed in this student's life today? What could I do that begins to strike up an evangelistic relationship where I'm warm, I'm winsome, and I identify with Christ? How can we plant seeds today? That's really a game changer whenever we begin to think like that. So now I want to go lastly to um, practice. And I've shared many practical tips, but, but I want to give you one verse and then a mental grid that I use. So um, here's the verse. Go to the next um, uh, slide, please. Proverbs 11.30. I love this verse. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is blank. Don't go there. Um, it's not blank in your Bible. Um, Toby's like, that's cool. Um, uh, but here's what I, I want you to think about. How would you fill in that verse? Here's a way to think about it. What do you feel like you need in order to be a soul winner? Maybe it's he who is bold. He who wins souls is bold, is smart, is funny, is one of high status has money, power. What do you feel like? Like, what's your excuse for, I, I would probably be an Epaphras if I had a little more knowledge, if I was bolder. Like, like what is it for you? What do you feel like you need? And, and real, more importantly, what did Solomon say? Um, go to the next slide. He who wins souls is wise. Wisdom. And particularly this Hebrew word for wisdom, it means skilled with people. It doesn't mean book smart. It means he who wins souls is wise in the way that they deal with others. Think about that. How much time and attention do you give to your people wisdom skills? Um, the Apostle Paul in Colossians 4 said, pray that God would open a door for my message. And then his prayer was largely centered on wisdom. He said, pray that I would speak it clearly. Pray that I would respond to each individual. And then he said, and pray that I would be wise in the way that I relate to outsiders. Wisdom. I think this is what Jesus said when he said, be innocent as doves, but be what? Shrewd as serpents. How many sermons have we heard on being a more snaky Christian, right? I honestly think that our evangelism is suffering because we're too dove. No, no. We're only dove-like. We're only honest. We're only truthful. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying be dishonest. I'm saying that we don't have this serpent-like 
wisdom about us where we're looking at people and we're willing to withhold certain things when necessary. You know, Jesus himself, John 16, 12, I have more things that I ought to say to you, but it's more than you can now bear. Think about it. Jesus, what he said was always right. It was always true. But even Jesus withheld, withheld some things because it was more than they can bear. I think in our evangelism, sometimes we need a little more serpent-like wisdom. Let me give you an example. I, I read of, uh, you know, part is learning how the culture views you as a Christian, right? Being aware of that. Years ago, a book came out called Unchristian. It was a five-year study about those outside the Christian faith, how they think about those inside the Christian faith. And they ended up with 10 major characteristics that people stereotypically put on Christians. And I said, I want to know that because I want to intentionally avoid those. And, 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 what I, and, and I avoid them by shocking people as the opposite. Um, and, and so, but anyways, you could probably come up with a list. But two of the most obvious characteristics that those outside the faith put on Christians are, what do you think? Judgmental, number one. The second one is what? Um, Self-righteous, uh, uh, that was on the list. Um, hypocritical, so that, it's actually very similar. Judgmental and hypocritical. In other words, they said, we spend all of our time picking on others' thoughts when we have plenty of our own that we should be working on. So you know this in relationships. And so I read Unchristian, I read this verse, and, and, and I had an opportunity in 2006, it was right when this hit, to apply this. I'm living in Blacksburg, Virginia at the time. My neighbors all know that I've, I've identified with Christ. They all know I'm some professional Christian. And I'm out. We host all the time. We invite him over. I'm joking about professional Christian. Some people say, he is so, you know, uh, rude. Or, or um, you know, I'm, that was a joke. Um, and uh, I'm juggling the soccer ball. And the boyfriend of one of our neighbors comes out. And we're juggling. And we're chit-chatting. And then he just switches subjects. And, and he says... You know I don't believe in organized religion. Never talk to this guy before about spiritual things. <laughs> you know I don't believe in organized religion. Immediately my mind was flooding with the reasons and the defenses why anytime you want to do anything, you gather others to do it. Well, why'd you join me kicking the soccer ball? Why didn't you get your own soccer ball and start juggling right there? Like, why'd you come here? Because you think that we could do something better together than you can. I'm flooding and flooding. And then I realized, I realized, what's the wise thing to say here? And I said... You know, I said, uh, I don't believe the Cubs are going to win the World Series. <laughs> he looked at me and he goes, what? And I said, you told me something you didn't believe in. I thought I'd just tell you something I didn't believe in. <laughs> he said, it's weird. <laughs> Listen to this. A couple hours later, uh, I was sitting on my front steps. And he walks over and he sits down. And he says, I know you go to church. Where and why? And I thought to myself, that was it. He wanted to talk to me. But he was wanting to see if first I would pick a fight with him. He was expecting me to be defensive and to be judgmental and to respond and correct him. And when I didn't correct him, he realized this is a safe place. We can have a conversation. And so that night we talked for a long time and we had many, many conversations about God and the gospel after that because I was willing just not to be so defensive and so aggressive. And I went back that night and I wrote in my little journal, I wrote, before you step in, a, but, well, I said, fight to get on the steps before you step to get in a fight. Fight to get on the steps before you step to get in a fight. That's just wisdom. And, and, and I'll say one more thing, and then I've got three minutes. So here's, I want to give you a grid. Um, here's what I would say. I used to think that wisdom was knowing the perfect time to bring up spiritual things. And, and, and for a few years, that was my strategy. And I talked to very few people about God. There was never a perfect time. I could always come up with a non-perfect time. And then, and then I learned that wisdom is not knowing when to bring up spiritual things. I always bring up spiritual things. In some capacity, wisdom is knowing how to respond to their response when you bring up spiritual things. I'm going to say it again. Wisdom is knowing how to respond to their response when you bring up spiritual things. What would you do today? Oh, I was in Augusta. actually got to speak at a church. 
That's, that's someplace I'd never be. Okay, that tells me something, you know. I might back away. Or really, like, really, where? I grew up. I went to a, you know, like wisdom is I identify with Christ as early as possible in some way. And I say, yeah, actually, to be honest, uh, was really, you know, our, my yard guys the other day, they were here and they said, uh, I said, lightning struck a tree in our yard, you know, and they said, let's hope it doesn't fall. I said, actually, yeah, I've been praying about it doesn't fall down. And they're like, yeah, that's true. That's what you should be doing is praying. So there's a positive. So now we got a little something to work with. Um, wisdom is knowing how to respond. Let me end with this. Here's my mental grid. Uh, this is called Five Winds of Building a Relationship. I came up with this years ago, and, and, uh, and this just guides all of my relationships. Um, if we'll go to the next slide, if you want this, because I'm going to zip through it, um, Mike will give it to you. I know you can't see that. That's just to give you a big picture. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, here, here's, here's how I think about every relationship that I meet. Number one, I want to generate a positive response to my presence. I actually care about smiling. I care about looking people in the eyes. I care about my body language. Um, I want somebody, I want to find common ground with somebody. I want to win their smile. That's my goal. And you, sometimes, you know, some people, it takes a long time to smile. The guy who owns the local burger shop, Cavalier, it's been like eight years. I still haven't got a smile. Um, and, uh, but I want them to say, I'd like to see him again. That's the value of mine. Number two, I want to show them that I care. I want to show them that they're important. I want to figure out a way to serve them. I want to listen and learn from them. These can happen right away. I mean, literally, this can happen in a conversation. Yeah, I was wondering, um, you know, when uh, the new pirate sh uh, movie showing today. And I might say, well, I'll look it up right now for you. It's just showing I care about you. I care about your life. It it's not. Uh, well, actually, speaking of movies on boats, have you ever seen Noah's Ark? Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> no, you know, you could do that. That actually would be pretty good. Um, but... Um, I want to listen and learn. I want to remember them. I want to win their trust. I want them saying, wow, they didn't have to do that. This is what we do in our neighborhood. They didn't have to do that. You were winning trust. Number three, I want to bring up spiritual things in a non-threatening way. I want to tell my story. I want to ask about their story. I want to discuss other stories. I want to win their curiosity. I regularly think about ways that I could ask questions that spark the curiosity of people. This is a question that I ask, I've asked for years. I say, hey, uh, just give a question. You know, uh, you know, uh, faith is an important part of my life. I, I've been thinking about a question and I like asking people this. Uh, what did God tell Adam in the garden regarding eating? And everybody says he told him not to eat. And I say, you know what's so interesting about that is that's what I thought initially too um, because we just assume that God is a God of no, always preventing from life, keeping from life. Do you know what God actually told Adam? And they say, what? And I say, Go read it. And I, and I go, just kidding, just kidding. I'm going to tell you. He actually said, you're free to eat from any, any tree. Just don't eat from this one. And I'm starting to see that actually God is for me. And the things he says no to are to protect me for life, not prevent it from me. It just, it just sparks curiosity. Uh, I, I would like to think and talk about that some more. Um, and then one number four, secure an intentional time to talk about God. Inspire them to want to get together. And we usually jump to win number one. Will you come to my church? Will you go to this Bible study? Um, and, and I just have found that if you jump past the smile, if you jump past the trust, if you jump past the curiosity, then you're going to get a lot of no's. And if you actually will do one, two, and three, then a lot of times people will ask you, hey, could I join you at that thing? Um, inspire them to want to be together. I don't ever assume that somebody wants to be there. <laughs> Invite them to get together. Secure a time. Win their time. I'm planning on being there. Uh, and then lastly, um, this, is, this is my grid, um, is win number five, is to create a fun, relevant, and engaging spiritual environment. Um, win their involvement. I never knew God in the Bible could be so fun and interesting. Those are my words for it. But people say, I actually got something from that. Um, thank you so much. People say to me all the time, I've been around the Bible all my life, and I don't think I've ever learned something. I just learned something in a couple of minutes because I thought I want to help you take away something. So um, that's what we got. Uh, number one, passion. Um, in order to be winsome, be won by God, be warmed by God. Number two, practice or perspective. Go from hearing to understanding. Go from event to process. And number three, um, practice. Uh, seek wisdom. Um, seek wisdom. Uh, all right, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this room. Thank you for the work of God at First Pres in Augusta, Georgia, and beyond. And Father, thank you for this global force that you have not only invited us into, you've actually given us stunning promises that you'll be with us as we go. And we seek to be local faces 
who are furthering the global force of the kingdom of God, the story of the gospel spreading throughout history. I pray, Father, that you would um, encourage this room, encourage this room to plant seeds, not trees, that you would encourage this room to be aware of relating to others in wisdom. And we pray all this uh, for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you.